You ever been forced to look into a mirror? I mean, really look into a mirror that looks right into your soul? <laughs> um, you'll know it if you have. Uh, there's um, a book that I read in my early 20s, uh, a book that kind of messed me up. <laughs> Um, I don't think it was designed to mess anybody up, but when you read certain things and you're already in a certain state of mind, even the most sort of, I don't know, innocuous book, although it's, this book really isn't all that innocuous, can mess you up. Um, it's a book called Klein and Wagner, and it's by Hermann Hesse, of all people, to write something horrific, but he was pretty accurate at describing and discussing inner turmoil. Hermann Hesse uh, often gets to uh, uh, dismissed as naive hippie literature, but I think that that's not quite an accurate reading of Hermann Hesse. There is that element in his novels, but there's some pretty dark stuff as well. Klein and Wagner is one of them. Where um, the main character, um, Klein, is familiar or comes across in the newspaper a guy called Wagner, I think, who had killed his entire family in, in a brutal manner and something like this, and they were talking, and the main character sort of thought, is, is denouncing this brutal murder in the most horrific terms, um, a little bit overzealously, and his friends remarked this, what's, okay, I, I, we're all horrified by this, but you're kind of going overboard, or at least you're more strident in your denunciations than anyone else is, any of us are, um, and the novel is Essentially, it's a novella, really. It's quite short, less than 100 pages, I think. It's about um, Mr. Klein examining his inner life. And he was basically projecting. As a regular human being, a normal human being, with the multifaceted inner life we all have, part of him approved of what Klein was, or what Wagner had done. Um, part of him understood uh, what Wagner was, because part of him was Wagner. Um, well, that's what I mean by looking in the mirror and looking into a mirror that looks deep into your soul, kind of like the it's kind of like a demonic version of the Pool of Galadriel. <laughs> um, do you want to see what's in there? <laughs> yeah, go ahead and look, but. Uh, be prepared. We're all sadists and murderers and whatever. Um, that's part of us. It's not all of us, but it's part of us. And by otherizing other human beings and projecting that onto them, um, you simply perpetuate it all and you don't deal with the actual issue. Assuming there even is an issue. Um, the the um, normal way in psychotherapy where they teach you to accept that about yourself is to say, okay, you allow that to come forward slowly and in small pieces and you try and understand what it is. That's all. Um, because once you see, once you look at square in the face, you'll see it's that part of you that likes this kind of thing is not necessarily going to act on it. In fact, it's more likely to act on it when you repress it. You're more likely to act on your own insane impulses when you refuse to stare them in the face. Um, you know, you, you're being followed by your shadow. Every time you turn around, it's gone. That kind of thing. Um, I haven't blown the plot, by the way. The plot has got quite a twist in it. Quite a few. Um, there's another instance of this which is, in many ways, even more interesting. Um, because it, they, it's quite blatant about it, the movie Manhunter. It's the about, it's the original Lecter, um, Hannibal Lecter uh, movie, where Will Graham, Bill Grisham, the same actor, um, the guy who caught him, uh, is trying to find another serial killer, and they've the police have gotten this guy Will Graham to find this other serial killer because. Graham knows that he's just like these serial killers, and he's able to anticipate their moves. But he doesn't. But he's a regular guy, you know. He uh, he wouldn't hurt a flea. Um, well, actually, he would, because he's a policeman with a gun. But you know, he's not a particularly sadistic fellow, not at all, as a matter of fact. Um, 
And in order to catch this other serial killer after having put Lecter in prison, he goes back to prison to talk to Lecter to pick up the scent. <laughs> and the to and fro in there is really good. Uh, that scene, I can't find a link for it on YouTube, but if you can find the movie, it's really good. It's about Lecter confronting Will Graham with his own reality. Not Lecter's reality, but the reality they both share. Um, Lecter immediately notices, um, and Lecter, of course, being a genius, you're here to pick up the scent, aren't you? I'm not going to help you. You want to pick up the scent, Will? Smell yourself. <laughs> and, of course, Lecter is right. <laughs> Um, and the movie is basically Will Graham's inner turmoil to come to terms with his own version of Wagner, his own um, approval of the things that these people do. Um, and, of course, the implication is Will Graham, as opposed to Klein in the novel Klein and Wagner, is aware of this, and he admits this to himself, that he has this problem, and he, everyone knows it. Um, he hasn't. Uh, he's, he's gone to a mental hospital as a result of it, and things like this. He knows that it's in there, and you know this makes him a valuable commodity to the police forces of the United States. And he's constantly seconded all over the place to find these insane axe murderer type people. Um, so, how do you stop the sadism in this world, Mister Vic Mackey, twenty four? Do you otherize these people and say, these bad people over there, these witches, all we have to do is round them up and burn them and everything is fine. It's the old um, scapegoat mechanism. Always, it's it ends up being scapegoating. Why? Because you're punishing this one thing for what we all share. Common humanity. Schadenfreude. Um, I keep asking Vic, uh, who has an interest in eliminating sadists from this world, up to and including pushing the red button. If you had one of these sadists in your power, the worst of them, and they were completely at your mercy, and you could do anything you wanted to them, um, whatever you did... Would you enjoy it? Or if you were merely tempted, um, would part of you know? Uh, would, would you recognize that hunger, that desire to visit the worst atrocities upon this sadist who clearly deserves it? You get to punish people, but you also get to feed your own inner Wagner at the same time, and you can do it completely righteously. That's addendum for you. Um, addendum is, in my opinion, and I'm not interested in discussing this, he's just a sadist who has found a perfect way to scapegoat the entire human race. <laughs> um, again, that's just my own personal opinion. Um... You notice how a lot of these, uh, uh, this is a common theme that comes up. A lot of the people that I speak to who have actually been sort of overwhelmed by the Wagners of this world tend to sort of seek out these um, forums and websites where you see all the horrible suffering in the universe. Um, Biodegradable Man was, you know, one of the ones that um, first mentioned this uh, in a comment section of one of Ed Endem's videos in my experience, but I think I remember talking about this years ago with a fellow by the name of Skid Row Radio. He too seemed to have this strange itch where he needed to go and find out about just how horrible the world could be. You don't have to go onto the internet to find out how horrible the world could be. Does that frighten you? Does looking into that, what would you call it? the pool of Sauron, <laughs> the Palantir maybe, but worse, because in the Palantir you're looking into Sauron's eyes, 
in uh, the pool of Sauron, I guess, you'd be looking directly into the darker recesses of your own being. Does that scare you? Is that a monster that must be ruthlessly caged? Or else it will simply run amok? I am of the opinion that the best thing to do is to tell the truth to yourself. If you don't have these impulses and you don't have that inner struggle, then this argument I'm making does not apply to you. Um, a lot of people do deal with that inner struggle, facing their inner demons. Facing your inner demons can be a horrific thing. A lot of people, I assume, are going to be killed by that. Uh, again, I, I believe that that's uh, the implication in The Last Messiah. The man simply looked into his own soul and couldn't handle it. He had a side of himself that was extremely empathetic and extremely tender and warm and kind and wouldn't hurt a flea. He had another side that just liked to tear things, his throats out with his teeth. He knew that that was it, and the contradictions inherent in that killed him. Um, I can see that happening to people. I can see that driving people completely mad. I can see that turning people into Hannibal Lecters, because they cannot reconcile that kind of contradiction in their life, and they're terrified of the idea of taking the lock off that off the grates of that um, caged beast down in the dungeons of their soul and letting it out. Um, that beast is down there. That beast is part of us. It's not all of us. That's the, that's the strange thing about this, this terrible fear of this beast. Um, you let it out and it will run amok. The only way to save us from all of this is to kill it and Obviously, the only way you can kill that beast is to kill the overall thing, yourself. Um, you believe that because you have this beast in yourself, that, you know, a lot of suicidal thoughts from... Uh, the suicidal thoughts that, I've, that I had when I was in extreme depression was, were essentially, I don't deserve to live. Um, because that beast was manifesting itself in my mind, and I, again, I never heard a flea. Um, when I was depressed. In fact, I didn't have the energy to do it. I, most of the time, or a lot of the time, I couldn't rise from my bed. I couldn't put two, one foot in front of the other. It was that bad. <laughs> um, so, you know, I knew that I was more or less harmless. But I also knew that, look, there's this thing down there inside of me. What do I do about it? It's inside of everybody. It's part of being a human. Um... We don't have one nature. We have hundreds, thousands, millions of natures, if, you know, you want to count them. And we've all got that mad beast down there. Do you go down every so often and spray it with mace just to make sure that it's boiling over at all times? Do you go down there and just continue to hate it and try and kill it and, and torture it and that kind of thing? Or do you go down there and occasionally feed it. You know, you go onto a particularly gory website, and you're not quite sure why you're there, but the beast knows. The beast has to be fed. Because um, you can either understand it and calm it down, or you can feed it. I would posit the view that um, making peace with that beast, understanding it and trying to calm it down, is a lot less dangerous than hating it and believing that it can be eliminated. Um, Nietzsche, in, on the genealogy of morals, posited an interesting um, hypothesis on the origin of corporal punishment. Um, this person has caused me suffering, I get to cause suffering to him in return. Why? Because there was a blatant admission in the ancient world, I guess this is what he says in, on the genealogy of morals, that we all have schadenfreude and rather nasty schadenfreude. He made you suffer, now you get to gain pleasure from making him suffer or watching him suffer. That, in his opinion, is the origin of corporal punishment. Um... 
That's a gutsy thing to say, isn't it? That um, we all like this. As I say, you've got Adolf Hitler strapped into a dentist's chair and you've got all the implements you want. What are you going to do? What does the beast want you to do? Mm-hmm. <laughs>